Good evening and welcome to this latest edition of the Elephant Conversations. And this evening um, we are continuing a conversation that we started with uh, Dr. Wambia Njoya, who is a public intellectual who teaches both within and outside the academy. Uh, she is also an award-winning uh, blogger and uh, has been uh, really the leading public intellectual around the issue of, of educate, the education system in Kenya. And so this is our second conversation, and it's, it's a follow-up to the, to the initial one we had last week. Karibu sana, uh, Wandia. Asante sana, John. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. Um, um, you know, last week you gave us a, a really good overview of, of Kenya's edu education system, and, I, and, I, and, I, and we ended up with um, with your overview of the competence co competency based curriculum that is now um, being introduced for for Kenyan students. And I was very struck by some of the comments that, that you made. Um, but I wanted to start with a, again, you know, with a very sort of simplistic question of, you know, how how come CBC, the, you know, this competency-based uh, curriculum, looks so different from all the previous ones that we have? I mean, uh, all over social media, you see um, questions being asked about the little drawings and, and pictures and that, that are being put for uh, for kids to explain things. And some, you know, I I used to think these these were were jokes actually, only to discover that actually no, this is what uh, this is part of the, the curriculum for kids. What's being taught to children? How come this this curriculum looks so different? I think it goes to two philosophies which are in the CBC. The first one, of course, is competence, and competency is a word which is usually used for employment. Mm. And the idea is that whatever skill you are teaching, the child must demonstrate competence at that skill. So in this system, there's no longer the possibility of waiting for a child to develop skills. Once a child learns a skill, they must show competence at it. And so that's why they have to keep on doing all these uh, tasks and skills. Uh, partly because the child has to demonstrate competence, but also because the teacher must have have the, the teacher must demonstrate that they taught. Mm -hmm. So it's also for the teachers to to protect their jobs mm -hmm. that they are doing this kind of drama around their assignments. Um, and then you know even th they had talked of uh, a continuous assessment. So if you're doing continuous assessment, you have to produce the evidence that the kids did what you say you taught them to do. So the, all that adds up to, to these, these lengthy and you know, huge assignments. The second one is the parental involvement. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand why they took such a literal understanding of parental involvement. Uh, parental involvement doesn't have to be parents doing homework. It can be, you know, parents coming to see the teacher, parents attending um, events. Uh, you know, there are other things to do for parents, yes. not not doing the homework like they are also kids. Yes. Uh, but because they interpreted it so literally, so now they are telling the parents to to show that they have also participated in the assignments. But there's also another agenda with this parental involvement, which is for the state to shift responsibility for education to the parent. Yeah. So it's a way of saying, you know, if, if this child doesn't do well, it's because the parent was not involved. It's, it's an insidious way of privatizing education. But unfortunately, parents have understood it. Kenyan parents have understood it in the church sense of parents being involved in their children's lives but that's not what it is it's it's about privatization of education and making parents responsible for what should be a public and a public endeavor mm. um, that's uh, that's you know that's a very very it's a profound point uh one day and i wanted just to dig into it just a little a little bit more to ask two questions um 
I mean, how do parents cope with this? Um, uh, especially those who don't have the economic means to be able to to be as involved, or, don't, or sometimes don't even have the capacity to be involved in their children's homework as much as they would want to be the only child, children to be educated, but don't necessarily have the skills or the time or you know um, uh, the capacities to be able to uh, assist them. Uh, number one, number two. Um, how do how should parents deal with this with CBC? How do they mitigate it? Uh, that's a, a huge question, but it's here, and kids are being pumped through the schools using this system. Uh, how how do we mitigate it, given these new pressures that it's piling on both parents and children? I think parents have to accept that there is more. There, there are different layers of intervention. The first one has to be the political one. They yeah. must say something. Mm. They can't keep keeping quiet or just tweeting. Mm. Um, they have to organize, come together as parents, even at a school level, come together as the parents and talk to the school and intervene. And and some of them are experts. They can say, as as far as we know, this is not what teaching is, or reduce their assignments. Because, um, you know, when you're saying a child must go and download a photo to prove that they have learned, I mean, what are you saying? You're saying you don't trust the child and you don't trust the parents. So I think parents politically can organize and intervene at the school level, but also at the national level and just uh, raise a voice and say that this, this curriculum is not working for their children. Mm. But until then, until uh, we figure how to do that, um, I think parents have to accept that CBC will let their children down in terms of uh, connecting the dots. Mm. Because what competency is, it, it splits uh, knowledge into tasks. So you have this task and you have this task, but kids don't learn the connections. They don't build up on one and another. That's that's the problem with competency as it is. I mean, even if it's perfect, that's the basic idea. So parents have to supplement their children's income. I mean, sorry, children's um, education with arts and stories. Mm -hmm. They have to you know, be more deliberate about giving their children extra materials to read and if they can't afford to read tell them stories tell them stories about your life the stories you are told by your parents because that's what will keep their souls intact as they go through the system the people should not expect cbc to to do everything for the child the child will need a lot of uh the real parental involvement they will need is is storytelling um maybe some a work ethic so that children don't come out of the system so so reliant mm -hmm. on the school system to tell them what to do you'll have to people have be, have to be more deliberate in in encouraging uh, kids to do things because they it's the right thing to do not because it's an assignment or because the teacher said mm -hmm. so those are two things i would say that that parents need to do at home okay. yeah um i i when we spoke last time uh, we touched on the issue of social media and the reason i always raise it uh, is because you know we have a generation now of of students of young people who um, who live part of their lives in that social media space and whereas it's more you know those who are better off are the ones who are more you know e find it easier to be able to engage in that way um you know you find um mobile phones um, even in the informal settlements in the rural areas amongst the youth uh, that's that's you know the costs are, are now uh, make it possible for children to engage in that way and and i wanted to ask again for 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 parents, given CBC and the limitations that um, you have described, the challenges that it poses, how do how do parents how do how do parents adopt and adapt in this social media age uh, to help their kids? Um, 
I think the first thing we need to ask, to realize is that social media is just media at the end of the day. It's the only difference is that it's readily available. Yes. So whatever um, guidelines you give your child uh, for TV is the same one for social media. Uh, you just need to uh, be, be aware of the resources on the internet. Now, this is not real parental involvement yeah. um be aware of the resources that are available and direct your child in those resources don't don't just uh, leave the phone only for your own things you know explore as a parent what your child can, can what can be interesting your to your child discuss it with your child so that uh, your child i think the basic thing is to teach your child that uh social media is useful if you're using it for the information that is useful yeah it's just like books and newspapers you know there's some articles that don't work others do so you just need to guide your child in using um social media although one of the things you know that should have been done with this uh, cbc i mean with the education system if we were serious about digital learning was to include um, uh, mobile phones as part of the technology instead of saying oh we'll bring laptops and signing uh, what are those things tenders for somebody to supply laptops use the phones yes. you know encourage kids to do certain activities on their parents phones yes. in the evening and that would be their digital education but Unfortunately, we, we looked at it from the big spectacular uh, optics. Yeah. So we wanted laptops and yet the mobile phones are easily accessible. They are always being used. Th that would have been a good way for, for parents and teachers to teach children how to use phones and, and the internet. Uh, let, let, let me step, step back and um, ask about uh, the uh, the institutional uh, in infrastructure for this sector, um, you know, with the Teacher Service Commission, uh, the Kenya National Union of Teachers, the Ministry of Education, you know, historically in Kenya, these have been institutions uh, that have been solid, um, you know, the, the solid part of our lives. It's always, you know, I've always told people that, you know, um, the, the Kenya Drama Festival, uh, you know, and the Kenya Music Festival, which are organized by the Ministry of Education, uh, are, are massive enterprises that you know many many governments in development developing countries can't pull off um, on that scale where every you know where you, this aggregation from uh, from all, all around the country to the, you know to, to, to one central um, uh, finale. Um, but we've seen. Um, a lot of reportage on developments vis-a-vis -vis Kenya National Union of Teachers, which is service commission. And I wanted to get your sense, you know, these, these pillars of our education system, uh, what's happening in them at the ministry, uh, amongst the teachers, what's happening there? And how does it impact the implementation of, of CBC and the overall delivery of education? Mm. Wow, that's a that's a complex story. Um, since 2010, the space has been constricting. Ideally, uh, teachers unions should be the ones, uh, you know, raising the alarm about uh, the deprofessionalization of teaching, and they should have been the ones giving their professional opinions about the curriculum and whether it will work. In this case, we didn't hear much from them. Uh, Wilson Sosion was almost like a lone voice and they, and he was undermined by the TSC uh, not paying the union dues to the, to the union. Um, but in 2010, what happened was that uh, DFID, the British government and the Kenya government wanted to come up with a way of employing teachers who were not trained. Um, and, and so uh, they thought that if we have a curriculum with less content, then we don't need to employ trained teachers. 
But before they embarked on that project, they decided to conduct an experiment where you have untrained teachers uh, teaching parallel with trained uh, untrained teachers on contract uh, teaching parallel with 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 the unionized permanently employed trained teachers, mm -hmm. and the union not uh, went on strike for that, and they said. Uh, no, if these people are going to be employed, uh, are going to do the work, you must employ them like any other teacher. So from that sense, even when you look at the report of that experiment, the, the, the two governments became anxious and felt that they needed to disempower the teachers. And then also later on, they came up with this idea of having cheap schools with a very simple curriculum which can be just transmitted through a tablet and the teacher reads it out to the children and this teacher is not trained does not care about the pedagogy or the psychological welfare of the students and that the the imagination was, was that anybody like could teach since they were not trained teachers and you don't have to pay them a lot of money so that was sort of the political interest in having a curriculum like CBC, where it is parent intensive and not teacher intensive. And then that way you don't have to employ teachers on permanent basis and they don't have to be trained. Mm -hmm. So that, that was um, that whole um, trajectory from 2010 till, this, to, till today is what has uh, made us witness the disempowering of the Kenya National Union of Teachers. And then of course, the problem with CUPET is that they, I think they feel that as high school teachers, they are better than primary school teachers. And that, that alone is enough to divide a union. Um, so that's why they, they, they have not had much say in th this time round. When it comes to the uh, drama festivals, the, we've been seeing also a constricting of space. When I was in high school, we were the ones who wrote the plays. But now it is, uh, there's a training, uh, there's a theme. You know, in our days, we didn't have a theme. You just do a play that you like and that you've written and you present it. These days, there's a theme that plays must be written to. So it's more controlled in terms of what students can can do so the joy of uh, students writing their own play and producing it and presenting it has has gone because uh, schools are more interested in the glory and the trophies and so they're hiring uh, people to 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 write for them the plays so sometimes you see one teacher having plays in three or four schools um yeah, so that's what's happening. So I think what has happened is that as the as the demand for education has expanded and as the political, uh, you know, the the politics of making sure more people enter the school system, as that has happened, the people in Jogo House have felt that they need to control more and more and more. So they are constricting the space as more people enter the system. Uh, uh, most most uh, interesting, and yeah, of course, it, it, it poses uh, major challenges. Uh, you mentioned the the uh, you know uh, international uh, development partners' involvement in, in the education sector. I wonder whether you can s say a bit more about that vis-a-vis uh, mm -hmm. -vis CBC. Uh, because I remember when we spoke last time, uh, even 844 uh, came out of, I think, it was a Canadian educationalist who was, the, who was quite central to the introduction of 844. Tell us something about uh, CBC. Unfortunately, Kenya has had this tension. It's a sibling rivalry between the British and the Americans. So at independence, we got this American system, no, sorry, British system with the A-level, that A-level, which, which was also introduced in Britain to reduce the number of people who would be eligible to go into university. Um, so that's a system we had. But, you know, as, as questions and discussions about higher education continued, the Americans were pushing 
for less time in, in uh, high school and also for an, a seamless transition between Tibet and, and universities. Mm -hmm. Uh, the British were of a different opinion that once you finish TVET, that's the end of your, your schooling. Um, and you can see that's the, the different uh, philosophies. You know, the Americans tend to be a bit more uh, open while the British want, you know, an aristocratic system. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when Moy wanted to open up the system, uh, I've had one person say, and, and I tend to believe that, although I haven't verified, I've had someone say that um, Moy didn't want to change the system using uh, another Kenyan because, you know, people would have said, oh, this guy from a small tribe, what is he doing changing the education system? So he picked a Canadian who would have looked more neutral, quote unquote. Um, and so with the Canadian, we went to the, the liberal arts system that the Americans are familiar with. And the liberal arts system is where you learn all subjects rather than just specializing in one at a very early age. You learn all subjects so that you can be an all-rounded person. But like I said last week, the point of, of reducing the number of years in high school was to increase the, the opportunities for people to enter university, especially from areas where there were not many schools that were doing A-level. Um, so there, there is a, an int, intra-imperial rivalry even with CBC, because with CBC, we are going back to the British system. Uh, even the method of, of evaluating teachers was brought to us from straight from the UK. Um, so the, the, there's an, and the funding also for CBC was from the UK. So there's a, there's a, I think there's a British interest in us returning back to the system that they know. And of course it comes with perks. Like um, you see, if you, you make, uh, Kenyans do the six year system, then if they want to uh, study abroad, they will apply to um, British universities as opposed to American ones. Mm -hmm. So there are all these interests, but I think uh, the main interest was an economic one. Mm -hmm. It was to reduce the complexity of the education system so that they don't, we don't need trained teachers to teach it. And the hope also was that technology would take over the role of the teacher. Mm -hmm. So if you make the curriculum very simplistic with little content uh, anything, and, and, and make the parents responsible for any additional uh, content, then now you can just put kids in front of computers and not have to employ uh, living teachers. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was the fantasy behind it. That's, uh... Very interesting. I, I, for you as a, as a teacher, uh, lecturer, uh, professor, mentor, how do you mitigate uh, when interacting with students um, who you can tell are suffering? You know, I was very struck um, when we spoke last time that you said uh, that your observation is that actually the eight for four system. Uh, you know, for all its weaknesses and the criticisms that have been leveled against it, produced a more rounded, uh, you know, human being at the end of it, person who was capable of much more um, uh, critical thinking um, than CBC promises. Um, and I'm sure there, you know, uh, especially in the middle class, we've seen this massive migration to to, to British and American systems of education. Uh, and I'm sure you come across um, students who um, uh, aren't sort of uh, uh, inclined towards critical thinking, uh, would not really read very much uh, outside the curriculum. They want to pass exams, get the marks, and have a certificate at the end. Uh, and it's a sort of sort of innate curiosity that is essential for education mm -hmm. uh, is, is is blunted. And I actually wanted to to, to finish with with a, with a question of how do you mitigate it? Uh, somebody who's been involved in education directly, you've, you've, you know, you've been involved in the American Ivy League system, and 
you've also you've now been engaged in the Kenyan system for quite some time at different universities. Um, one of the things I've noticed, which and rather late in my career, I, I must say, um, is that there's a lot of violence in the school system. Uh, so it's not really a curriculum problem, it's a violence problem. Mm. Uh, violence in two, of course, the physical violence, but there's also a violence in the way we shut down uh, kids from asking questions. We refuse them to do any academic exercise outside of the curriculum. Like one student told me she was punished for reading novels mm. outside the classroom. Mm. So um, that's that's what, what I have started to notice and deal with because the students have named it for me. Mm. Um, so I ask them questions about what they have learned. I also ask them to talk about their own experiences, especially when we are doing assignments that they must integrate their own experiences. And that's a part that students find very difficult because they have been taught that uh, their experience doesn't matter. They must just repeat what the teacher says. So that's how I mitigate. Um, those those kinds of problems. I also try a bit to to apart from mentoring, you know, opening up students to other uh, other knowledge outside of the curriculum, which is very risky mm. because we are examined also as lecturers, and people want to see that your exam has the syllabus. Mm. So there's a lot of control, and and that is why I've. I have uh, sort of become a public voice because I'm starting to say, I think Kenyans need to have a conversation about what education is for. We can't keep trying to manage children like they are, I don't know, like machines that they must produce what we want or else they have failed. We have to open up the system and that comes from opening up other cultural spaces. I think Kenya is so restricted mm. and and this has been happening for the last 15 years I I I don't know why um so that's where the problem is and and I try to to open up the students minds to the world when I'm teaching but it's very difficult when you have certain institutional requirements and these requirements come from the government mm. um is it's if it's it's one of the I mean one of the, the striking things I mean Kenyans remain very invested in uh, in education I mean it, you know um, and I think like in all developing societies um, that is uh, is common um, just I just want to throw in a one one last question I know our time always passes so quickly um, what has the impact of COVID been you know um, on on, on education, uh, even if you just take yourself as an example, uh, because uh, the whole world has been affected by this. Uh, in, amongst the middle class, it's much easier for them to transition to this kind of, you know, using Zoom like we're using it now. Um, but um, how, what has the impact been, and how do you think, um, what kind of, how would it affect uh, our children as they go through? I think the most important one is that it has amplified the inequalities that were already there. We've become more conscious of them and also the children in areas which did not have access to technology or internet have suffered more. So I would say that's the major impact of, of, uh, of, of COVID. It has amplified the inequalities. It's those who have access to technology who have been able to sail through and and for me that will be the biggest question that we will have to answer when hopefully the pandemic is over how how do we one diagnose the the extent of the discrepancies between the children who have access to resources and and those who don't have who have and then now also say what are we going to do about it um on 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 the part of us teachers we've been distant from the students we've not been meeting them mm. so like now we've done almost two years of teaching 
students whom you've never met that that has a has an impact on the psyche yeah you you we want to see people especially when we are trying to mold them yes uh, so that has an impact on us but at the same time we are we are anxious about about covid especially because of course teachers are older so they are more vulnerable than the students so that's that's something that we we also grapple with yeah but um all in all it, for for me at least um it has been a time to stop moving in the traffic jam also so there has been that that advantage but all in all it has aggravated the inequalities that were there before and that's a quest, that's a conversation kenyans will need to have going forward great uh, um... As always, uh, Dr. Andy Ajoya, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for joining us again this evening. I'm sure we shall have to revisit some of these questions, um, especially as the COVID vaccination program is rolled out more intensively and people begin to go back into the education system. And I think there's some changes which, you know, I'm getting the sense that have happened as a result of things like COVID, but uh, for some, these, these inequalities are very stark. Um, there's some, uh, classes which uh, you hear young people saying yeah they don't see the need of going back into class they're able to it will, you know that they can do it via zoom but of course mm -hmm. uh, that's only available to uh, a small percentage of, of those in our education system so i'm sure they yeah I, I think we have to change also the way we teach i don't think this uh, syllabus exam syllabus exam mm. model it's not working no. yeah we have to change it but yeah, will the bureaucrats agree? I, 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 shall, I, I shall call on you to, to explain, to, 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 uh, uh, to inform us and educate us on that as it becomes more and more apparent. Dr. Wandi Joya, thank you very much for joining the thank, thank you very much, John.